know, I wasn't really sure which Joe Hill book I was going to read next. Then one day I had the old iPod, yes, iPod, on shuffle, and a good old Nirvana tune came up saying, Hey, wait, I got a new complaint. And I knew exactly where we were going next. <laughs> Hey, what's up, bookworms and Judas Coin groupies? Mike back some more. Joe Hill. This time we'll be talking about the 2017 novel, Heart Shaped Box. Now, this is his debut novel, and a lot of people didn't know is in 2005, he had written some short stories and released those in a collection known as 20th Century Ghost. Yes, I still got just the digital copy. I haven't actually got the physical on that. I know it's a sin for some people, but you know, hey. It's a, I'm a book collector. Eventually, it's going to happen, right? But uh, it, this one was actually recommended to me before I knew who Joe Hill was. Like I said, I knew that Stephen King had three kids, and I, I didn't know any one of them known, named Joe Hill, right? Obviously, he was Joseph King back then. So I had no idea that this was the son of Stephen when he actually uh, come out. But uh, this is one that uh, has been recommended to me numerous times after I read Nosferatu and really, really enjoyed it, which I just talked about recently. In case you missed it, I did talk about Nosferatu earlier this week. Now, that was my introduction, Joe Hill. So this is the follow-up. So am I going to enjoy it as much as I enjoyed Nosferatu? Or is this going to be, even though I'm doing it out of a publication order, will this be a sophomore slump for me uh, as just like the second book of his that I read? Well, let's talk about if it is a good follow-up here. By getting into what is it about, you guys? Now, aging death metal rock legend Judas Coyne is a collector of the macabre. He's got a cookbook for cannibals. He's got a used hangman's noose, a snuff film, and a confession from a witch. But nothing he possesses is as unique or as dreadful as his last purchase off the internet. A one-of-a-kind curiosity that arrives at his door in a heart-shaped box. A musty, dead man's suit still inhabited by the spirit of its late owner. And now everywhere Judas Coin goes, the old man is there, watching, waiting, and dangling a razor blade on a chain from his bony hand. And he is always there, just watching and waiting to do well. You'll find out, guys. That is 2007, the debut novel by Joe Hill. Okay, now, guys, with this, we're going to get what makes it good or bad. And look, I'm going to put you at ease here. You guys know what a Stephen King fan I am. I'm going to try not to bring that up too much because I know I did do that in the Nosferatu review. So what I'm going to try to do here is just talk about this as if he's just any old author, right? I will try to do that here. So uh, if you guys are worried that the whole time I do this, because I think that's unfair to him to kind of judge him based off of what his dad has done. So I'm going to kind of keep this as I would any book review. And that begins like usual, guys, with what makes it good or bad. The good for me, guys, I love Bond and Angus. Now, these are Judas Coyne's dogs. And yes, uh, I am a fan of dogs. I am quite a dog lover. I've had a dog ever since I basically can remember anything about this lifetime. I've had a dog. And so I think that I, the idea of his dogs being, you know, just kind of his animal companions. Uh, I mean, anytime you're kind of dealing with uh, supernatural fantasy, I'm always here for an animal companion, right? So that's something that's very easy for me to get into because I love animal companions. And obviously, I love dogs. And I love that they're named after members of ACDC, right? Uh, but uh, with this, he presents the idea of our pets being our Familiars. Now, if you're not really familiar, familiar with what a familiar is, basically, uh, they can protect. They can protect us against evil. Uh, they can protect us against spirits and things like that. Uh, like think back to the uh, the old. Remember the movie 1990 with Patrick Swayze called Ghost, where the cats basically could uh, see the spirits and they could actually like the or kind of like what uh, Brenda, uh, Brenda Fraser did in, in the Mummy with the cat. Kind of like sort of like that. Think about it on that level, whatever, where our pets can actually protect us from things. And I, I love that. I love that. It's like a great idea. I've never really seen it done quite the way that he does it in here. I think it's just a great, great touch. But I just think that Bonnet Angus, obviously, if you're a dog lover, you're going to absolutely love these two characters. I mean, it's about as much, the, the most that you can love non-speaking characters in any book, I think. I, I enjoyed them quite a, quite a bit. But then you got Craddock, which is the villain of the story, mostly. Uh, he is legitimately creepy. Uh, and I would say about this book is I always say that once you get past a certain age, it's kind of hard for a book to scare you, really. There are some legit chills in this book that if you're reading it alone in the dark, in the middle of the night, you're going to start being like, what was that noise? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's got those kind of effects on it, you know. So uh, I think that uh, horror fans are going to be quite pleased. The premise is solid and the atmosphere is very, very bone chilling. I think we really get into it uh, a lot and you will get the chills running up your spine, I think, more than once. I love Judas 
as a protagonist, really. I love the idea of an aging rock star. Now, you know, most of these horror stories, it's always, they always kind of go with like the everyman. This one, he decides to go with a celebrity, but a celebrity that's clearly uh, past his prime. I mean, he's still very much in, uh, in in the public consciousness. They, they still know who he is. You know, if he walks into a place, people are going to be like, oh my God, we know who you are, kind of thing. But this isn't like a guy who's like in the middle of, of touring and things like that. He's, he's pretty much post his rock career, early retirement from rock and things like that. But you get to see, obviously, if this is a rock star, the guy is not exactly squeaky clean, right? He has a, a lot of skeletons in that closet, so to speak. And you get to see those uh, kind of unwrapped slowly through the book. I, I love the way that he does it. You start to find out things about the band members that he had. And you get this slowly, you get a lot of this, this background for him. And it's, it's earned. It's just really good character work. And I think that what he does that through the course of this book is he takes Judas from, I'm not going to lie, at the beginning, kind of maybe not so likable to where you're really, really rooting for the guy by the end of it. And to me, that's just great, great character work. So I definitely want to give him credit on that. And the thing is, is guys, he's not even the most well-developed character in this book. No, I think that's got to go with Georgia. Now, Georgia was a character. I thought she was just kind of going to be that obnoxious, uh, annoying character that our, our main characters kind of has to like get rid of before he goes on the full adventure. She has the best arc in this book. I think at first she kind of comes off as kind of obnoxious a little bit and you kind of wonder what her point is in the story. And over time she becomes every bit as important as Judas. And I love the relationship that these two have. I mean, they're not married, but they feel like an old married couple, the way that they legitimately care for each other. They bust each other's balls. They fight. They love. I mean, it's it's really it's a really well done relationship. You can really see it, especially a relationship where you've got the age difference that these two have. You really can see how well that is done here on these pages. And I think that he is just really, really good at that. So uh, building relationship trees too and building their character arcs this book, both are just brilliant. Uh, then you also have uh, Florida. Now, if you're wondering about the state names, I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, Florida, now you get, uh, this is a character that has uh, passed away, but you get her backstory through the process of this book. And what I think is really wonderful about this is, is that it sounds weird to say wonderful, and then I'm going to say her story is very heartbreaking, is I think he's able to touch on, you know, repressed memory from really, really bad things in their life. People can do this. And depression. He tackles both of those just head on, goes all into it with this character. And I think it's done just superb the way that he does it through flashbacks. It's really good. And I mean, look, you have a great, great character work for this trio. And I feel like all of them are really very different by the end of the story than they are at the beginning. And uh, broken record here, guys, that's just great character work. He shows that he can do this. I think this is better character work um, for more than just our, our lead character than we got in Nosferatu, which I think is a superior book. But I do think that the character work in this one is a little bit better. Because I think in Nosferatu, Vic was really well done. Uh, Lou was really well done. Everyone else was kind of like, oh, okay. Look, this, I think with these three, it's just, it's just awesome. All three of them are done really, really well. And you know what? Craddock isn't done that badly either. He does a great job with our villain. But uh, look, it just has an incredibly sharp narrative. You've heard me complain in the past about uh, jumping around the timeline. And uh, Lies a Lot More always comes up as the one that I always like bag on, saying that it was a really good story if they would have just had an editor that would try to chop down on the way the narrative was explained. With this, I think he does it perfectly. It's almost done in like that Lost way. You remember, guys remember Lost, the TV show? Uh, when it was really, really excellent is it would have the characters in now. And then when it was important to the story, they would flash back and show how they got to this point. And then it would go back to real time and then it would flash back again and give you a little more. And it kept doing that back and forth. And it would finally, at the end, it would give you that big revelation as to why they're doing what they're doing now. And it does it just like that, just perfectly, perfectly paced, perfectly written. I cannot explain. The execution is done so well with that narrative. And so many authors drop the ball big time on that. He does not. He does it great. When you get those little flashbacks, they are always important and they're always perfectly timed. So, uh, Hats off to him for that one. Also, if you're like me and you're into like 70s, 80s, 90s rock, I think you're going to have a great, great time with some of the references in here. ACDC, obviously, like I said, with the dogs. Uh, he mentions If You Want Blood, You Got It, things like that. Uh, Zeppelin, Pearl Jam, obviously Nirvana, we get her heart-shaped box, up to like Jackson Brown, things like that. 
all kinds of stuff. Ozzy, anything that you guys were thinking of from that time period, uh, he kind of brings it up. But I, I think it's never in a way that you have to know what these things mean to enjoy the story. It's just, it's kind of one of those things like, hey, if you like it, uh, you, you'll notice it and you'll kind of be nodding along. Like, yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I like that. I like that quite a bit. So uh, obviously this is alternate history. So this guy was a big time rock star at the same time as some of these bands. Like he talks about, you know, opening up for Zeppelin one time and things like that. So uh, it's fun. It's fun to play around with a little bit. But uh, the big thing here, guys, I think it has a very satisfying ending. You know, um, not quite where, where Nosferatu, I said, I felt like you was really, you were holding your breath at the end because you didn't know which way it was going to go. With this, I don't think it's really like that. It's just, it's a pretty optimistic ending, you know, and it was one of those kind of stories where you didn't feel like uh, it was going to have a happy ending. And I think it's mostly, I'll say optimistic. Like I said, it, it's pretty well done. And, it, and it's done in a way where I feel like if he ever wanted to return to these characters, he could. And now that I see that he does have a shared universe, maybe that will happen somehow. Or maybe we'll see crossover one day. I don't know. We'll see. I, like, like, I was looking at his, um, his bibliography. It doesn't look like he's writing very many novels. Uh, at least he hasn't in a while. So uh, I'll address that at a different guy, time, guys. Let's get into uh, the bad here. There are some things that may not click for you. Didn't necessarily mean they were bad for me. Some things that just might bother a couple people. Uh, I think early on, uh, the probably the one real writing flaw that I have in this is it's kind of hard sometimes to decipher. And this might have been intentional. Uh, to decipher what is actually happening and what is like a dream or a vision or something like that. Uh, because there are moments where things are going on early in the book. I'm like, is this, is this a memory? Is this actually happening? Or is he dreaming right now? And I think a lot of authors do this. And I'm just like, I never know what's actually happening right now. But like I said, he might have done this intentionally to kind of create confusion with the story early on. I, I don't know. I don't know. That might actually take you out. It did a couple times. It did really confuse me a little bit. But now that I finished it, I can look back on it and be like, okay, I bet that was actually intentional to be that way. Uh, the prose isn't spectacular, but again, guys, if you're looking at this as he was a debut novelist, I think it's quite well. It helps when you have one of the best-selling authors all time in your house, probably to be your, your alpha reader. I think that probably helps a lot to get make sure that your, your writing is pretty, pretty good. So uh, there is that. But uh, yeah, nothing that's going to make you ever be like, ah, oh, God, this guy, what, what is he trying? He's like some fragmented sentences and stuff. You're not going to be doing that. I think it's it's good enough for that. Uh, naming numerous characters after states is kind of obnoxious. Uh, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee. Now, I've met people like that. Like when I first moved to Texas, I did have people on the baseball team in high school say, hey, Georgia, or hey, Atlanta, get over here. That's where I moved from. Uh, I would get things like that. It happens, you know, or you move up north from Texas and people call you Tex. Same like that I, I can see that but he does that with like four or five characters in this and it's like why don't you call anybody by their names man but uh, i i could see that could just be like you know one of the things that he does you know I, I i can see that but then he starts calling them by the real names too and you're like starting to feel like a fantasy book where every character's got two or three names you know the sword of the morning things like that so uh but again nothing that's going to really take you out of the book or nothing it just can be kind of like this is really weird i think and then there's the middle section where there's like a road trip and that section is going to lose some people. Me, what I've always said about his dad's works is that I love when he does that kind of stuff. I love that just seeing people's regular life. Now, obviously, this is their regular life under a dire circumstance. So I'm always on board for it. To me, that's where you build your character. That's where you get your flashbacks. That's where you get all your backstory. And I think, again, I think it's perfectly paced that way. But uh, for if this is your first time getting into uh, that kind of story, it might uh, it might be a drag for you. But uh, I, nothing I'd call it bad at all. Let's get on to why you should read it, guys. I think this one's pretty simple. If you like animal companions, you're going to be really, really on board for this. Again, I think the things he does with animals in this is really, really a sharp idea. And if it's been done before, I haven't really seen it quite the way that he does it here. Uh, I, just, I just love the idea. It was probably my favorite thing about this whole book. If you're interested in ghost stories, this is one of the better ones that I've read. I think this one will stick in your head a little bit. If you're into hauntings, if you're into the occult, things like that, you're going to find some things quite enjoyable with this. I think you'll, like I said, you'll, you'll, you'll be thinking about this for a few days after you finish. This isn't one of those five minutes or, uh, five minutes after starting to read something else you've already kind of forgot about it. You'll still be thinking about some of the things in here. Like I was walking through my house in the dark the other night and we just got new furniture and uh, I didn't recognize the way that the arm on the, the new couch looked and I thought it looked like somebody's leg and it scared the shit out of me and all I could think about was Craddock in this when he first sees him sitting in a chair. So uh, <laughs> there are things like that will stick in your head, right? But if you enjoy Enjoy 
uh, rock and roll references. Like in a Kings of the Wild way, you know, I talked about in Kings of the Wild is he mentions all of those rock methods or rock rock stars and rock names and stuff. If you get them, they're cool, but you never have to ha- know what these things are to understand the story. But if you do know these things, it's a lot of fun. I think you'll have a good, good time with it. Now, as for my final thoughts, guys, uh, look, this is a heck of a debut novel. I got to say, I was rather impressed. I was, I feared reading it out of order, reading one of his more popular ones in Nosferatu, and then going back to where he started, that I was going to like it a little less. Now, I do not like it as much as Nosferatu, but again, guys, Nosferatu is an amazing book. I freaking loved it. So uh, comparing it to that might not be that fair. If I had read this first, guys, I would have loved it every bit as much as I love Nosferatu. I think it's a really, really spectacular book. Legitimate creeps at some part, and some parts that really did give me some chills, and that is not hyperbole. It really is uh, that good. But uh, I said I wasn't going to bring it up here, and this is why. Because I don't feel... I feared with this first published book, I feared it was going to feel like a carbon copy of his dad's stuff. But it's not. It's not. It really does feel fresh and original with a lot of his own ideas. And I do dig that. You know, he's not, he's not, uh, he's not going to the well, you know, and trying to just uh, retell some of the stories that his dad does. I mean, look, in that regard, he's already a more talented author than Frank Herbert's son, right? So, hey, great premise and it is executed extremely well. Again, I don't know how much is him and how much is the editor, but whoever paced this book the way they did, Props to you is so, so well done and deserved. And as for novels, guys, Joe Hill is now two for two with me. Uh, obviously, I love uh, Lock and Key as well. And I love In the Tall Grass, which is also part of a collection, I believe. But I, I read it. It came out as a, a PDF when it was just released as him and Stephen King working together. So, uh, again, those aren't novels. So I'm just talking about the novels here. Yes, two for two for me, guys. I think this is a great time. And you guys are going to enjoy it. If you like a little horror, and if you like a good ghost story, this is going to satisfy you. So guys, have you read Heart Shaped Box? What do you think? Drop in the comments and let me know your new complaints. <laughs>